Hello. So good afternoon, everybody. I will continue today on the chapter about theories of demography. And in the last class, we were talking again about the demographic transition theory, about the four stages, giving a little bit of more information compared to what we saw in that chapter about the world population trends over time. And um, so this is the general graph that symbolizes the changes in fertility and mortality over time as the society gets more industrialized and modernized. I also show this other one kind of subdivided stage three into these two here just to show how the trends in population increase have been changing over time, kind of stable and then really steep. And then afterwards, still increasing, but not as much as before. And now in some areas, in some countries, even experiencing some, some declines. Um, and I mentioned some examples of the population distribution in the world that because developing countries started the transition later than developed countries, they still growing their population at a much faster play, pace than developed countries. And because of that, we see a higher share of the population in less developed countries in more recent years. And like I said, this is again related to the chapter about world population changes over time in which we highlighted that uh, the African continent is expected to increase a lot its population for the next decades. And even Asia, it's experiencing some um, reduction in population growth rate, but it's still it's going to increase up to 2050 and Africa up to 2100. And related to this discussion, I mean, remember this chapter, what we are trying to do here. We are trying to look at previous studies that explain these changes in demographic components over time, explain changes in population over time. Basically, what the first demographic transition told us is that first mortality declines because of the process of industrialization, we have better control over diseases, infectious diseases, communicative diseases. And then after a while, fertility rates also start to decline. And then we reach really low levels of fertility and mortality. And in more recent years, some demographers, they have been analyzing that in some countries, you see even further decreases in fertility. And those even lower levels of fertility, they are due to several different reasons that these demographers have been analyzing. And related to topics that we already discussed here, such as these demographic changes that we see in the US, we have been seeing an increase, increase in age at first marriage. Of course, people also have children even before they get married, but the chance of having children increases a lot when someone is married and when you delay the age in which you get married, you also delay the age in which you have children and fertility drops, at least in the short term. There are increases in cohabitation. Again, people can also have children when they are cohabiting, when they're not formally married, but the chances are lower. And we also see increases in divorce. Emergence of same-sex partnerships and marriages across the whole world. Increasing rates of non-marital childbearing. In this case here, it goes in the opposite way. Those countries that experience a, an increase in, let's say, teenage pregnancy and also pregnancy while um, women are not formally married, when you see these increases, then you might see some increases in fertility as well. And more and more in our society, in the contemporary society, 
is acceptable, culturally speaking, uh, for people to decide to don't have children, right? We voluntarily, voluntarily decide to don't have children that if it's a great proportion of the population decide to don't have children at all, that we also have a negative impact on fertility levels. So this further declines in fertility, and that's something that we're gonna discuss a little more, bit more in the chapter about fertility. It's due to this behavioral um, characteristics of people, these behavioral changes is called the second demographic transition, right? So that's set of like new work that emphasizes that the further fluctuations in fertility are due to these behavioral changes. And the, like I said, when we have postponement in fertility, people delay the age in which they have children. In the short term, you might see a decline in fertility. But as these people, and more specific, when we measure fertility, we're talking about women. When women, they decide to have children, maybe the fertility will go back a little bit. And then when their daughters will have children, maybe they will also postpone to the same age as their mothers, but the levels are already catched up. So you might see some dips in fertility, but as the generations start to have children around the same age, it comes back into similar levels as we had before, usually around two children per woman. But of course, even some countries that we saw some postponement in fertility, it did not go back to all these two children per woman, such as South Korea has really low levels of fertility. Some uh, Eastern European countries, as we discussed here already, okay? But all these different changes, these behaviors that we are experiencing in our life that have further impact on lower levels of fertility, all of these different factors, they are, they are bringing more knowledge about demographic changes. They are related to what some demographers call it, the second demographic transition. The third demographic transition brings into the debate migration. Remember, the first demographic transition was about declines in fertility and mortality. The second demographic transition says, oh, we are still seeing really um, significant drops in fertility in some countries like Asian countries, Eastern European countries, Western European countries. What are the reasons? Second demographic transition. The third demographic transition, as explained by Coleman, is trying to understand further changes that we experience in populations over time. As we have seen, there's an increasing tendency of low fertility countries rely on immigration to maintain their populations. Some countries like Western European countries, you would expect them, since now they have fewer proportions of children, but they still need people in labor ages. As these children get older, you're not gonna have enough people in working ages to maintain your population. You would expect them to rely on immigration. Immigrants, usually the higher rates of uh, migration are around the ages of uh, 20 to, to 35, really labor ages. So you would expect these countries to want more immigrants so they could work in the country and provide resources to children in their elderly population. And higher levels of immigration, if you are talking about international migration, changes the composition of national populations. It changes culture. It changes physical appearance. It changes social experiences. It changes identity. And that's a really clear case in the US and Western Europe. And what you start seeing in these countries nowadays is exactly a backlash, right? It was like really clear politicians, really clear in the former federal administration say, hey, we don't want as many immigrants because we are changing our identity, our culture. 
So that's much more ideologically an ideological reason than anything else. And the same backlash we also see in Europe when you start to see flows of immigrants trying to reach Europe now with the Syrian crisis because of the Syrian civil war, a lot of refugees trying to go to Europe and Europe kind of trying to push back. So all these discussions, oh, fertility is declining in those countries. You would expect them to have, to be open to bring more people in. But when you bring more people in, it changes the country. And then there is some backlash of the population that was there before. Is it because immigrants bring more crime, bring more issues to the society? If you analyze the data, no. The chances of immigrants committing crimes are lower than the native population. This, if you're talking about the US, then the US born population. So the pushback is much more ideological. It has much more to do with prejudice, with discrimination, with racism. And all these topics, all these things are related to demography, right? And a major point that's highlighted here and for the US is that children of immigrants are the vanguard of the third demographic transition that we remake the US. Children of immigrants, in this case, are people born in the US. I'm from Brazil, I moved here, I'm a first generation immigrant. My children were born here, they're second generation immigrant. Although they are called second generation immigrant, for me, they are the same thing as previous generation Americans. They will learn English. They will be going to school since they are children. They will learn the American culture. My challenge will be to give them a little bit of the Brazilian culture, right? And that's the challenge of immigrants, to keep a little bit of their culture towards their children. And these people who in some way are influenced by other cultures are increasing in the US, the second generation. Right, and of course the third generation as well. But all those people born in the US, raised in the US, experiencing the American culture. But also that changes in composition is related to that book, Diversity Explosion, that I mentioned to you already in this course by William Frey, the demographer that works at the Brookings Institute. He emphasizes that, oh, there is a change in the composition of population using pretty much census data in the American Community Survey. And analyzing these changes in composition of age, race, ethnicity across the country, right? For local areas at the county level. You can read his book, you can get this data directly from the Census Bureau. All this information is widely available. But trying to understand how these populations will have enough people working for them, for that, for a population that has fewer proportion of children and higher proportion of older people, and the higher proportion of older people will put pressure in the working age population, a lot of societies are trying to, to deal with that. And some other researchers, some like more recent developments in demography have been emphasized, for example, in some European countries, still the female labor force participation is really, it, it's still lower than the male labor force participation. The proportion of women who are working in the labor market outside of the household or are looking for jobs, so one possibility to increase the proportion of people in labor ages is to influence in some way female labor force participation increases. And that has to do also with fertility because maybe some women decide to have children and then having to have children, raise children in a society that still uh, has really gender inequality in terms of who takes care of children 
they will give up their professional lives. So in some way, they state some form of public policy trying to provide enough resources to women to have children, but also work in the labor market. Another topic that has been coming up in Western European countries is that there is a delay of young adults entering the labor market. That's not really the case as much here in the US. I mean, education is so expensive that people start working while they're studying to try to survive, to pay tuition and fees and everything. We start to get in a career in some way or the other. But in a lot of Western European countries, you still have this delay in going to the labor market. People stay in school for longer. That's not a bad thing. But what we, they, these countries are starting to think is how, yes, we should invest in higher education, including grad school for our population, because a higher proportion of our population with graduate school will be beneficial to the country in the future. But how can we have that and at the same time have these people already engaged in the labor market, right? So that's, these are all these different issues that are bring because of that, because this lower proportion of people in working ages, it brings the debate about migration or more specifically immigration it brings about the need to increase female labor force participation. And it brings the debate about having young adults entering the labor market uh, at the younger ages, at least. Again, that's not really a clear debate here in the US, but in some other countries it is. And I'm not saying what's correct and wrong there. I don't want to privatize universities in Europe. That's not the point. The point is to create some incentives that people can invest in their education and at the same time uh, enter the labor market. Overall, these demographic transitions are all interconnected with each other. The overall demographic transition, we first saw the topics about mortality transition mortality declines because of health transition. Now we have fewer people dying because of communicable and infectious diseases. That is also associated with declines of people having children. All these two things change age composition, population gets older and fewer people in, in labor ages. At the same time, you have the urbanization process, more people moving to urban areas. And that's one part of the migration transition. Migration also has to do with international migration, not only people moving from urban, from rural to urban areas, but also between countries. All these different transitions influence age, composition. Migrants, as I said, the higher rates of migration are between 20 and 35 years of age. Countries that receive more immigrants they will have a higher proportion of people in those age groups, changing their age composition. And all these transitions change how we live as a society. I showed you that graph by uh, Ruggles from the Minnesota Population Center, in which he shows the changes in family composition over time. In the US, you used to have more the corporate families, the one based more in agricultural production at the family level. And then you start to have more proportion of families in which the man provides resources by working outside. And now the dual world families in which both men and women work outside of the household. And this is all related to these changes that we are seeing in mortality, fertility, and migration. And this changes the society as a whole, how we develop, how we, uh, we progress. And now um, I'm going to talk specifically about each one of these transitions. And in the next slides here, I'm going to break them down, talking about mortality transition, fertility transition, migration transition. Overall, this is a summary of what we saw 
in these last decades, in these last centuries. We saw a shift from deaths at younger ages due to communicable and infectious diseases to deaths at older ages due to degenerative diseases. That's a summary of what we have been seeing in terms of health and mortality transition. In terms of fertility transition, there is a shift from what demographers call it a natural fertility. Natural fertility is this high level of fertility. And we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about it in which there is no control of fertility and you have people marrying earlier and engaging in, in sexual uh, activities and having children and with no contraception, higher levels of fertility and in a society that's healthier. And now we are changing to this more controlled fertility in which we start to delay age at first marriage, delay age in which we have children, and then fertility starts to uh, decline. And migration transition, there is a growth in the number of young people in rural areas, and those people will start to don't find job in rural areas, they, the rural areas will experience a surplus on people in younger ages and they don't have job enough for those people and they start looking for jobs somewhere else. So people start to go to urban areas looking for better economic opportunities. That's the urbanization process. And like I mentioned before, age transition are the change in numbers and percentages of people in each age and sex group correlated, associated with mortality and fertility declines. When mortality declines, you start to have more people in older ages. So it changes age composition. When fertility declines, it decreases the number, the proportion of children. So it changes also age composition. And countries that receive a lot of immigrants start to have an increase in the working age population. And countries that have a lot of immigrants, people getting out of those countries, have a decrease proportionally in the number of working age people. So the age transition is also called a master transition because it's kind of associated with the three demographic components. Urban transition starts from people moving from rural to urban areas. And it changes to what some demographers call the urban evolution, as most humans are born, live, and die in cities. And then they start to move from one city to the other. That's the clear case of the US. Even here in the US, whenever we say, oh, the rural areas are experiencing some economic challenges in the US, some rural areas, for example, in Midwestern states. But when you talk about rural areas in the US, they are completely different than rural areas in developing countries. Rural areas in the US, you still have within a few miles access to stores, access to health clinics, access to all the services. And in, in rural areas in developing countries, you don't have that it's not so easy to get access to all those services. And even the mode of transportation is much more expensive. It's much more affordable for people to have cars and move around here in the US, even if they live in rural areas. And in the US, another thing that we see is that a lot of these mid-sized cities, they have a lot of good job opportunities for people. So people decide to move from big cities into mid-sized cities because their quality of life maybe will be better there because they will have a good enough salary, maybe lower than in bigger, bigger cities, but the cost of living is gonna be much lower in those mid-sized cities. So my example, for example, moving from LA to College Station is one like that. It's one example in millions and millions that we see nowadays in the US of people moving from bigger cities to mid-sized cities. 
And family household transition, there is a diversity in composition and structure due to longer life, lower fertility, older age structure, and urban residence, right? And here in this portion of the chapter, Dudley Poston and Leon Bouvier, they will discuss some of major fertility theories. What are the fertility theories? They are trying to explain this thing that I said before here. Why? Why countries are passing from a high to a low level of fertility? So we first describe, right? Mortality is changing. People are living longer. It's here. And now people are having fewer children. Changes in fertility here. And people now are starting to move to urban areas. And we also see some migration between countries. Why is all this happening? We are just describing so far. And these different theories across the decades, across the years, they have been trying to experience it, trying to, uh, to answer the why. Why we have been experiencing changes in fertility, declines in fertility. And in this chapter, we will discuss three major theories. Of course, there are other specific theories that try to explain why fertility decline over time. But here focusing on these three groups, the wealth flows theory, human ecological theory, and political economic theory. And these theories, they just try to look at these changes that happen in all these different countries across the years and try to see if the set of explanations that they give for the decline in fertility apply to these different contexts. More of these theories can be used to explain different contexts, then they will be stronger. They will be more reliable and used by other researchers in the future. What exactly is the wealth flows theory? It was developed by Caldwell, and it's pretty much with the idea that the decisions of people to have more or less children is related into intergeneration flows of wealth and services. So in societies that really rely on the labor of children, let's say that families that live in agriculture and they have a small production, they have to produce some food and then exchange that in the market close to their houses, close to their community, their children also work with them, producing goods, producing food, producing, doing the activities, the labor activities that the parents also do. So in that case, since children are going to help me surviving, producing, bringing wealth to the family, the incentives of having children are higher. In that case, what I'm doing, I'm having more children because they will help with me with the labor activities and their labor will produce some wealth and this wealth will flow from the children to their parents. So there is this incentive of parents to have more children, right? When we start to live in urban areas, that's everything is more expensive, housing, food, education and now we actually try to put children into school and and there is an incentive of putting children in school because later in life they will get better jobs they will have a better quality of life overall in that case it's my the wealth of parents the money of parents the resources of parents that are going towards children so when you start to see wealth and services of parents going towards children with the process of industrialization and urbanization, then there is less of an incentive to have more children. Parents will tend to have smaller families. And that changes the uh, overall way in which we even see families. The emotional nucleation of families is crucial for lower 
fertility. Pa parents become less concerned. <laughs> parents become less concerned with ancestors and extended family than with children and grandchildren. What matters more is their children and grandchildren, their descendants. Some of this, this theory, as you can see, it's really economic based, really has this economic point of view towards it. Having more or less children is related to the fact that, oh, if I have a child, the child will help me producing more, and that's going to be good for our well being. Or well, now it's really expensive to have children. I would tend to have less children. It's crazy. A lot of resources have to pay so much. We have fewer children. And when you start to have this more nucleation of family too, in which the parents have to take care of the children and even paying for all their services, like little things like a nanny, this kind of services should take care of their children become so much more expensive than I will have less incentives to have families. But overall, this kind of theoretical background trying to explain changes in fertility has really this puts an emphasis on economic reasons of why people have more or less children. The human ecological theory doesn't look specifically at the individual reasons of why people decide to have more or less children. It looks at the society as a whole, at the macro level. It's a macro level perspective. So Dudley Poston, who retired from here and m and Parker Frisbee, who was a professor at uh, UT Austin, they developed or wrote some uh, studies about the human ecological theory applied to fertility. The focus now is in the society as a whole, not on the individual reasons of why people have more or less children. The level of organization and complexity of a society is negatively related with fertility growth. As societies become more industrialized, more modernized, experience more economic development, on average, people will have less children. High fertility makes the population vulnerable to environmental changes, we need more technological advancements and we experience other societal changes and fluctuations. Larger, large quantities of sustenance are normally consumed by the familial and educational institutions. So more for societies that have really high levels of fertility, we will have to have more technological changes to produce more to our families. And we're going to have to invest in education, education institutions to provide knowledge to, to our children. Low fertility, on the other hand, enables more sustenance to be available for investment back into the system. When the society as a whole, see, the, the focus here is on the society, not on the individual. When the society as a whole realizes that having less children we will have the same capacity in terms of technological advancements. We will be able to produce as much as before, but now providing more to the fewer people that we have. So the point here is to talk about the society as a whole. And the term ecological, Whenever you're talking about ecological theory or human ecological theory, this term ecological has to do with this macro level perspective. When I'm analyzing it at the aggregate level, I don't know if you ever heard the term ecological fallacy. Ecological fallacy is when you get data at the aggregate level and you try to give an explanation talking at the individual level. I'll give an example. A really typical example to talk about ecological fallacy. Let's say that you have two neighborhoods. 
One neighborhood has 70% white, 30% of black population, and the other one the opposite. 70% black, 30% white. And let's say that in this one here with 70% white, you have uh, lower crime rates. And in this one here, 70% black, you have higher crime rates. And then someone who doesn't understand the limitation of the data would say, oh, these high crime rates are due because you have a higher proportion of black, black population. No, 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 no. Calm down. The only information that we have is about composition. 70% white, 70% black. Low crime rates, high crime rates. Who are committing those crimes? Maybe it's the 30% white population who are committing those crimes, not the 70% black. Do I have the information at the individual level? Not from this data that I gave an example. Psychological fallacies when I get data at the aggregate level and I start to make conclusions at the individual level. In this case here, I have low crime rates, in this case, high crime rates, but the high crime rates might be exactly because of the white population committing crime. The 30%, right? How do I know that? I have to go there and see who committed each one of those crimes. What was the race, ethnicity of each one of these individuals who committed those crimes? And then I can make the analysis. But if I get aggregated level data and start to analyze as I had information at the individual level, but I did not have information at the individual level data, I'm making a mistake, a scientific mistake called ecological fallacy, right? So this term ecological is whenever we are talking about data at the aggregate level, okay? The third one, the third theoretical framework about fertility changes that is emphasized in the textbook. The political economic theory. In this case, the political economic theory is not really a, a theory per se, but it's more like uh, another approach in order to analyze changes, in this case, in fertility that have several reasons, not only at the individual level, like the wealth uh, flow theory emphasized, not only at the ag aggregate level, like the human ecological theory emphasizes, not only because of economy, not only because of culture, not only because of uh, age, not only because of changes in mortality that influences fertility, but because of all these factors together. All these different factors have an influence on fertility changing over time. So this framework tries to do analysis both at the macro and micro level using both quantitative and qualitative methodologies, analysis. And the idea here is that we need to collect data about the overall population. Usually this data is more quantitative, but we have to understand the reasons of why people are having less children. So it would be good to conduct some in-depth interviews, for example, with people, collecting more qualitative data. And then we have a deeper understanding of our society. The problem about this is that it's really expensive to collect all these different kinds of data, qualitative and quantitative data, at the aggregate level, at the micro level, at the individual level. It's expensive to get all that. But there are some examples in which we can collect data, all different sources of data. But of course, we start to focus more on specific areas. And the example that's given in the textbook is this community, Casalecchio in Italy, in which these researchers were able to analyze this life course perspective changes that were going on in this community throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And they had individual level data available to them. And life course experience means that 
they have information about people throughout their lives in different time points about the same people. They can collect information about these people over time. But they also had aggregate level data, macro level data about historical events on changes in labor, market patterns, on marriage patterns. And they emphasize throughout their study that fertility reduction depends on social class or occupation of families, a more macro level reason. But these macro level factors vary by different subgroups of people. Depends on individual characteristics. So both macro and micro level characteristics are important in the explanation of fertility. And that's actually the, cha the challenge. I mean, whenever we are in trying to understand fertility changes over time, even nowadays, we have limited data. What kind of data are we going to analyze? I cannot do this analysis that has all the different sources of data if I'm talking about the whole country. But maybe if I want to focus on the community, I will be able to collect these different data, uh, data sources. Right. So these are some of the major theoretical strategies or some of the major theoretical frameworks that you can utilize to understand fertility changes over time. The next subtopic, it's about changes in health and mortality throughout the populations. And whenever we are talking about mortality, actually, we are talking about two things, health and mortality. Health is related to what's the prevalence, what's the incidence of diseases in a population? What's the main causes of death? What are the main causes of diseases that people experience? When we are talking about diseases, we are talking about morbidity. It's more about health. And what's the pattern of death? Here, it's actually the causes of people dying. Here's the causes of diseases. And the causes of death are related more to mortality. And what we see throughout the societies throughout history is that the causes of diseases, the type of diseases change over time. What are the most common diseases that a population has been experienced changes over time, and also the causes of death. And understanding these changes, Omran came up with the epidemiological transition theory. And the basic idea is that we have a change from poor health and high death rates into a society with good health and low death rates. So we pass from poor health to good health, in other words, high morbidity to low morbidity. And also we go from high death rates, high mortality into low death rates, low mortality. And at this point here, when we had high morbidity and high mortality, most people were dying at younger ages due to communicable and infectious diseases. So infant, mortal, uh, infant mortality, child mortality, they were really prevalent because still those populations experienced really high levels of communicable and infectious diseases that kill the population. And the most vulnerable population to those kinds of diseases, children, babies. And then when we change into a society with better health and better and lower the, uh, uh, mortality rates, the people who die in those societies, the most common reasons of death are related to degenerative diseases and degenerative diseases at older ages. So we pass from a society that has high levels of mortality, poor health, into a society that has low levels of mortality, good health. Before, we had communicable diseases that affected 
the chances of surviving of children and babies. So infant mortality, child mortality was really high. Now, those diseases start to be more controlled and who start to be more successful of dying are exactly the older people. What are the usual reasons? Degenerative diseases. But the infectious diseases and communicable diseases don't disappear overall. And that's an example of what we are living right now during the pandemic. And during the pandemic, the people that are more successful, uh, susceptible of dying are exactly the older people. And mostly those that are not vaccinated, right? So infectious diseases, communicable diseases don't disappear. People start to have less chances of dying due to those diseases, but they're still out there, right? And going a little further on uh, mortality. So Omran, back in 1971, he proposed this epidemiological transition uh, theory or the demographic theory of mortality in which he also broke it down by stages. The first stage is what he calls the age of pestilence and famine. The reasons of people dying is usually due to influenza, pneumonia, smallpox, tuberculosis. There is high infant and childhood mortality, as I mentioned before. Imagine life expectancy at birth or the average life expectancy was between only 20 and 40 years of age. And in developed countries, it lasted until around 1875. That's crazy, right? How not so long time ago, 1875, people lived on average only between 20 and 40 years of age. Of course, some people live longer, but a lot of people, a high proportion of people died even before those ages. And whenever we see this historical series that we have nowadays and, and shows always reporting the population and having all so many older people there think, oh yeah, they were 60 year old, 70 year old. 80 year old people in those times. And they're usually represented in a much higher proportion than the reality, right? It's just interesting. Some more recent shows have been showing like people that look older and reporting have younger ages, exactly what was true at that time. As society progresses, more people live to older ages and older people start to look younger compared to previous generations. And we have a little bit of um, nostalgia of previous years, previous generations. Say, oh, at the time of my grandparents, they live in rural areas, was much healthier. If you look at the data, life expectancy at birth, the average time that people lived has been only increasing over time. And in the US, it's really clear. What, when was the case that the US experienced the decline already showed in class now between 2019 and 20 because of the pandemic, right? But across the years, decades, life expectancy increasing. The second stage as discussed by Omran is the age of receding pandemics. So basic changes in society that we see nowadays, we take it for granted improvements in sanitation, standard of living, and public health. All these basic infrastructure services provided to a higher, more people in our society start to give control some of these communicable and infectious diseases and people start to live longer. Life expectancy reached between 30 and 50 years of age. In developed countries, this period lasted between 1875 and 1930. The third stage, the era of degenerative and man-made diseases. So now heart disease, cancer, stroke, start to increase in prevalence in proportion of people dying due to those diseases. 
mortality declines exactly because we start to have advances in medical treatments, in prevention and treatment and treatment of infectious diseases. Vaccines. More people have access to vaccines for free. Prevention is not just about treatment, it's about prevention, right? And these medical advancements, health advancements, they become more accepted by the population as science starts to be part of everybody's or everybody's life. And then we accept, we understand, not just accept, but we understand these medical advancements. We understand the need to prevent diseases. We take vaccines, we take, we eat better food. We try to, to eat food with good vitamins and so on. And that has an impact, a huge impact in the life expectancy that starts to exceed 70 years of age. And fertility at this point starts to be the reason why populations increase so much as we saw in those previous graphs. Mortality declines so much because of prevention, vaccines, medicines, and so on. People start to live longer, but it's still people still have a lot of children, so populations start to grow a lot, right? And this is something that a lot of countries are still passing through it. Medical advancements, access to medication, access to vaccine is not at the same level across the world. And in more recent years, uh, Rogers and Hackenberg, they mentioned the fourth stage of the demographic transition of mortality, the hybristic stage, in which individual behavior and lifestyle influences mortality. Now people start to use more medicine, have better health habits, start to take vaccines for all sorts of diseases and so on, but still you have some people more susceptible to die because of accidents or uh, have negative effects because of alcoholism and dying because of suicide, homicide. And smoking and diet are major components of why some societies nowadays have bad health. And that's a major thing, health and mortality. The fact that now we exceed 70 years of age, it doesn't mean that in my last 10 years of age, I will have good health. That will depend, that will depend on my lifestyle. It will depend on how I acted throughout my whole life in terms of exercise, in terms of eating, in terms of smoking or not. Of course, if I die early or not, it's also based on back in the third stage, decades ago, if I decide to get vaccinated for diseases or not, that will right now just be a major thing if we die or not. But also, if we decide to follow science, medicine, get vaccinated and so on, and move on with life, how we act and how we eat on a daily basis is important for the future. And for me as a Brazilian coming here to the US, this is huge. I mean, Latin America, we usually have this culture of having lunch and dinner with families and usually more or a little bit of wealthier food. I like always make jokes that Brazilian food, the traditional food is pretty much rice, beans, meat and salad every day. If you go here to MSC, wow, man, it's hard to find anything that's healthy. Right? If you go to any one of these cafeterias at the university, the bad thing is that this lecture is being recorded. Anybody can watch it, including the university administration, but it's crazy. Right? How 
food that we are providing to young adults and also in schools to children, it's really of bad quality. And that will influence these people in their future, not maybe in mortality, but in their health, right? In the last 10, 20 years of life, that makes a huge change. I remember someone, a demographer, citing this study in which uh, showed that overall people who exercise throughout their lives, the chances of living at older ages is not so different than people who do not exercise as much throughout their lives. But the quality of life in terms of moving, being self-sustainable, it really is different. I should put on, on the course website this video that was developed, I think, by the Ministry of Health from Canada that shows exactly that. Should people around the same ages, I think around their 70s or 80s, having different quality of life because one, exercise had much more better health practice than the other, right? So the problem now is not just accepting science, not just accepting, I'm using this word again, understanding science and following science, Vaccination is a really clear debate that we have nowadays, but also daily basis, daily diet, no smoking, exercise, and so on. Third, demographic component. Now I'm going to start talking about theories that try to explain migration. Why people migrate? Why people migrate? from less developed countries to more developed countries. Why people migrate from rural to urban areas. And here, I just organized this slide to show the differences between the terms when we are talking about internal or international migration. Internal migration is the permanent changes in residence that happens within a country. So people moving within a specific country. International migration, that's when we have people moving in a permanent basis between countries. And these terms here are important in this, in this table. Usually people don't use them correctly. If I'm talking about internal migration, I'm talking about people, let's say, moving within the United States, moving from one state to the other within the United States. And I'm doing an analysis, trying to see the impacts of internal migration to the states of destination, the receiving areas. I'm talking about in-migration. For example, the state of Texas has been receiving a lot of migration of people coming from other American states. I try to understand how that affects the Texan population, the Texan economy, more people in working ages that generate economic development in Texas. That's good for Texas. I'm doing analysis of in-migration. I want to see areas, on the other hand, that are sending more people out of the areas. For example, specific Midwestern areas in the country don't have good jobs, and then people start to move away. And people moving away there it will create more economic recession. So I'm trying to talk about understanding the effects of out migration on the areas of origin, on the sending areas. In the US, we usually hear more the term immigration. That's because I'm talking about migration of people coming from other countries into the United States. And I'm trying to understand how that affects the American population. So I'm talking about the effects of immigration on the country of destination. But if I want to see, for example, some Latin American countries are sending a lot of its population to other countries, and these Latin Americans who are living Latin American countries, they're in labor ages. So we are losing working age people in Latin American countries. So that has a negative effect to the Latin American economy. And in that case, I'm focusing my analysis in the sending areas, in the areas of origin. I'm talking about immigration. 
right? So whenever you're talking about internal migration, we use the terms in migration or out migration. International migration, we talk about, use the terms immigration or emigration. What are the factors involved in migration? Fertility and mortality, they happen both because of biological and social factors. So there are genetic reasons why people are able to have more or less children or die earlier or not. But there are also social factors, right? For example, women have children due in part to biological reasons due to fecundity, the ability of having children, but also because of other socioeconomic and demographic characteristics, such as those women with higher education tend to have less children. Migration has no biological factor. A person migrates due to factors in the physical and social environments at the areas of origin and destination. People are influenced to migrate from one area to the other, much more related to socioeconomic, demographic factors, both at the individual level and at the aggregate level. Both individual factors, individual factors can influence migration, but also area level factors can influence migration. If the place where I'm living right now doesn't provide enough good jobs for me or good life opportunities, I would tend to move somewhere else, right? So it's just to emphasize that migration has no biological factors as we see in fertility and mortality. What are the reasons of why people move? And scientists, democrats have been talking about that, uh, trying to understand that those factors for a long time. Migration happens in response to a reason that the person believes cannot be satisfied in the place where the person lives right now. So that pe person moves somewhere else. The study of migration determinants dates back to the classical economic theory, uh, economic uh, development theory. This kind of studies date back to the studies of Ravenstein in 1885, 1889. He was already talking about migration as a mechanism that established this equilibrium among places, more specific, this regionless spatial economic equilibrium. Areas that have fewer jobs and more population or fewer jobs in relation to the size of their population will try to export more people, have more immigrants or out migrants into areas that have more jobs in relation to their population size with the idea that these areas this migration will continue until you have this equilibrium in the sense of similar job availability for the size of population in all these different areas and also migrants move from low income to high income areas from densely to sparsely populated areas. But you'd say, oh, but we see a lot of migration from rural to urban areas, and urban areas are more densely populated. But here the idea is that you are taking into account exactly what I just said before. The job opportunities that I have in these different areas in relation to the size of population. If I don't have as many job opportunities for the size of my rural population, even though that's a small population, I would tend to move into an urban area that has more people living there, but at least proportionally has more jobs as well. And population streams are expected to happen between the poorest and wealthier places and countries. So people tend to move from poor areas into more wealthy areas. And Ravenstein uh, discussed these major laws of migration. Migration is affected by distance. Most migrants move only short distances, but as societies develop, it starts to be easier for us to move long distances even between countries 
international migration also starts to happen. But overall, the chances of people moving between counties from Brazos County to another county nearby to Harris County, for example, is much higher than moving from Texas to New York, then moving from Texas to Oklahoma, to California, to Florida. Distance still matters. Whenever we are trying to understand the reasons of migration, we might try to put in our analysis a series of other reasons of migration, but distance still is always there present as one of the reasons of why people tend to migrate more or less. People migrate more into places they are close by. And migrants also uh, move in stages. As they leave one area, their places are filled by migrants from all the areas, from more distant areas. So you can even think about migration in the US. People start to move in west in the American history. And as this one's occupied more mid, mid areas in the country and start to move out, all the people took their places and then starts to going further, right? Every migration stream has a compensating counter stream. If we have a high migration from other states in the US to Texas, there is also migration from Texas to these other states. Maybe in lower levels, but you also have because you create this network of flows. The same thing you can say about international migration. If you have migration from Asia to the US, from Latin America to the US, you also have migration from the US to these other places. Maybe in lower levels, but also influenced by these networks that are created between these different countries. Migrants moving long distances often stop temporarily at major cities or centers of commerce located between the areas of origin and the intended final area of destination. So people might have the goal of migrating farther away, but it's also common for people to move to in between areas. Again, look at this time of publication the possibilities of moving farther away to other countries was much lower than what it is nowadays. Urban residents are less likely to migrate than rural residents, exactly because urban residents, you have in, in urban areas, you have more availability of jobs, of education services, of health services available, proportionally to the size of the population, right? And Poston emphasizes some intervening obstacles. Migration is due not only to a person calculating advantages and disadvantages. Oh, there is higher unemployment here compared to that other area. There is not good school here compared to other areas. So I moved there to give my children school. Of course, this macro uh, level differences. Can you close the door for me, please? I'm sorry about that. Thank you. So, of course, these macro level factors influence and these differences between areas of origin and destination. But all the factors are also important. We talked already distance, yeah, job opportunities, income opportunities, the characteristics of destination but also laws, migration laws. What are the laws that are being implemented trying to make immigrants less welcome in some specific areas might have influence on migration. As we're gonna discuss in the migration chapter here in the, in the US, after the 1980s, there was a huge increase in border security in the Southern border in the US. Huge increase, driven mostly because of political reasons, not based on science. The idea that the intention, at least what they wanted, was that increase border security and avoid immigrants into the country. What happened? Increase border security. It did not avoid immigrants to come. Immigrants arrived. 
But because border security was so much higher, they said, okay, in the past, the past generations would go back and come and go back. The temporary migration. Nowadays, because of increasing border security, they enter and stay. And then they go live in all different countries with their whole family. Not just one member of the family, but the whole family. So the migration law in that case had the opposite effect as intended. Information about localities. If I don't know that that area that might be even close by has job opportunities, good work opportunities, I will not move to that area. I have to have information about it. Some personal characteristics. What are my characteristics in terms of the jobs that I'm looking for? Usually more educated people tend to migrate more as well. Occupation also uh, influences the chances of migrating. What are my individual expectations in life? My goals in life? Oh, people are really talking a lot today. And this uh, last topic. We are having class, guys. It's until 2, 2 p.m. Uh, these other factors, community kinship ties. It's related to social networks. Again, related to those informa the, the, the set of information that I have about other localities. If I have friends, if I have family, living in another area and I have information about job opportunities, I will tend to move there because I have better chances of getting jobs. If I don't have information, if I don't have anyone living there, I will, my chances of moving is gonna be much lower. And that's really important. Like the, the, one of the most respected demographers doing studies about migration, and he focused a lot on the Mexico-US migration, Don, uh, Douglas Massey, a professor at Princeton University, whenever he tries to explain the reasons why people are moving from Mexico to the US, he tries to put all these different factors into the analysis. Differences between the economy of Mexico and US, but also personal characteristics. And also these social networks reasons, such as do I have families who migrated before to the US that will increase my chances of migrating? Do I have friends living in the US that will increase my chances of migrating, right? All these different factors might be important on explaining why migration happens. When we don't know, the goal is to put all these factors, all these possible explanations together in our models. And the thing that I'm gonna discuss here throughout this, the, the, the final portions of this lecture, there are different theories trying to extend, explain migration. What are the reasons of why people are migrating from one area to the other? I don't view these migration theories as competing with each other. I view them as complementing each other. I just said it. Like in these studies by Douglas Massey, some of them I will cite here. He tries to put all these possible reasons of migration into the model and see which are the ones that have the best explanations, better fit that specific flow of Mexico US migration. The thing is that migration is explained by several different factors, and then we have to have these different theories trying to explain it. Migration is influenced by individual factors, age, sex, education, race, ethnicity, social network, but also by contextual factors, by differences between the areas of origin and destination, right? Major a major theory that's discussed in migration that tries to explain migration, why people migrate, is this framework of push and pull factors. 
there are factors in the air of origin that make me get out of those areas of origin. There are some factors in the air of destination. There are these pull factors that attract me to these areas of destination. These push factors are usually negative. The pull factors are usually positive. When I migrate because of negative factors in areas of origin, migrants tend to be what is called negatively selected. When migration happens actually because there are good pull factors in the area of destination, migration tends to be positively selected. And I will talk about this more in detail on Thursday going forward on theories about both internal and international migration. 2 p.m. right now, a quiz is open on Canvas. Thank you very much, I see you on Thursday.